to welcome my mom. Yes. <laughs> and I see you all. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, here today, uh, while I interview mom, is not only all of y'all, but I've got both of my sisters. My um, sister who is was here before me, she doesn't like me to call her my older sister, so I won't. Uh, my sister who predated me, Catherine, is there with Randy, her husband. And then my little sister, Holly, is there with uh, her husband, my BIL, Kevin Roberts. And then their son is here, Will. Where's Will Ryan? Where's Will? And Will's around here. And then uh, uh, his Alyssa, wife. his sweet wife, and their two children, Kaysen and Piper, are here. So we've got a clan over here, and, and they can verify to the truth and accuracy <laughs> of everything that's going to be said. And I also, I'm going to brag for just a minute, because a lot of y'all think, okay, we want to hear the, the mom who raised, you know, Catherine the artist, or Mark the teacher or lawyer, but uh, I've got to brag on y'all since my little sister's been here the last time. Uh, she has been made the CEO, the head of Bible Study Fellowship, the whole international thing. And uh, uh, just really serving the Lord there. And, and any of you who've been blessed by BSF uh, uh, know that that's, that's a pretty cool deal. So we've got the mom of the BSF queen uh, here <laughs> as well. So let me, let me start with mom. And mom, um, I just want to go back to where you and dad met. Dad has uh, left us uh, February of 2004. But uh, tell us where y'all met. Well, I'll tell you. My husband... Um, was at North Texas University, and I was at Texas um, Women's University, and um, somebody arranged a blind date, and I was very careful never to go with someone that I wouldn't marry. And I had somebody else I kind of liked, but my criteria, and I think this is the criteria everybody should use when they look for a husband, is find somebody that loves God. Find somebody that's smarter than you and you can respect. And find somebody that amuses you and makes you laugh. Uh, you want them to be attractive, but you don't care that they're really handsome because time changes all of us. <laughs> okay, so you and dad meet, fall in love, get married, and Welcome the first child, Catherine. Where were we? Where were y'all living when Catherine well, came Catherine into the world? Well, Catherine was born when we lived in Denton, and by that time, I had become a certified social worker. But it was not long after that that we moved to Dallas, and because my husband worked for the railroad, he worked for the railroad before he was in the Navy. He went to the Navy, he came back, he went to school, and then he said, really, I only want to work for the railroad. And he worked for the Texas and Pacific Railroad, and they changed ownerships a bunch of times, and every time they changed, we moved. So we moved to Dallas, and uh, Mark was born. Uh, October 20th, 1960. But you don't send him a present. Send me the present because the mother deserves it. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I'm hearing amens from half of the All people the mothers. in here. Um, uh, okay, so uh, I was born. We moved. Well, ahead. wait a minute. Let me tell you about. I, I'm so glad he asked me. <laughs> I think I want to tell you uh, that when your children are little, really little, the secret is to establish a routine, and that routine has to include bedtime prayers. Do you still remember your bedtime prayer? Yeah, uh, you taught us, uh, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take, God bless, and then I'd list everybody, and I had to list myself last, in Jesus' name, amen. You got it. Okay. <laughs> but that's a really good way to make them think about not just their parents, but as their family grows uh, and as their friends grow. Okay, we move from Dallas. All right, so um, let's. Uh, one, one of my earliest memories is being at a Mardi Gras parade when we lived in New Orleans. Right. I was on Dad's shoulders. You were down to the left. These floats are going by, and they're throwing candy. 
and dad catches candy and hands it up to me. And I said, and I, and I was old enough to think, don't you normally pay for stuff because you, you got to pay for things. And I said, do we pay? Do we pay? And you said, no, it's free. And my thought in the mind of, I guess, a three-year-old kid was, why on earth have we not been doing this every day? And that's the story, except Mark could not talk. At least I thought he couldn't talk until he was over two because Catherine would point to everything. My family and his family lived in Texas, so we would plan these long drives back from New Orleans to Texas. And we had a Nash Rambler, so we'd make the seat down in the back. And uh, I had taken Mark to the doctor. He still, I said he won't speak. The doctor said he doesn't need to. He's got a sister who tells him what he wants. So we were in the car driving to um, Abilene, Texas, and it was night, and I thought the kids were asleep. And I said, I'm, I'm worried. Do you think they're cold back there? And Mark said, first words I'd ever heard him speak, Cajun, my feet cold, no. <laughs> and so... I realized at that moment that our next door neighbor had had an enormous influence on him. So be careful who you live by or they'll grow up talking who knows what. Yeah, yeah, my feet cold, no. Uh, uh, that's okay by me if it's okay by you. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, we moved back. Uh, to Texas, eventually. I think we lived in Shreveport as yes, well. Yes, we lived in Shreveport, and while Bill was gone, uh, Shreveport had a huge tornado. And it was at that time that Catherine was learning to tie shoes, and she kept saying, I'll do it myself, I'll do it myself. And I realized that the best thing you can do for your kid is let them do it themselves and teach them how to do it. And so my kids have always done that. I tied my own shoes this morning. I, I did. <laughs> I really did. Yeah, he did. But we'd had a, this tornado. And um, after Bill got back, we got in the car and we drove through and we saw, you've lived here. You know what a tornado can do because it was a disaster. I had no idea that Mark did not understand. And he thought a giant tomato had come through there and demolished the town. I did not eat salads for years. That's true. Uh, man, he would take the tomatoes, tomato out. They, he, those tomatoes do damage now. <laughs> he did not want to offend. Okay. All right. We get to Abilene, and that's the first time we lived in a place where we had relatives. Yes. Your grandmother. Yes. I had a built-in babysitter. I'd never had... Bill traveled. I never had a babysitter before. So, Mike, this is where we learned to play games. My grandmother was smart. She did not want to chase you. Uh, so she said, I'll, I'll teach them dominoes. And so one night, Mark had taken the dominoes. Catherine at the at time was not interested be, because... I had given her uh, a sketchbook. Other kids had coloring books and colors, but I gave her a sketchbook and colors, and I said, don't, I don't want you to stay in the lines. I think that imagination trumps knowledge. So show me what you imagined. And then in the meantime, grandmother was teaching him dominoes. Catherine learned too. She, nothing he could do, she couldn't do better. But um, I left grandmother babysitting, and uh, she had to go home. She said, I'm sorry, I can't babysit tonight. So I got a girl, a college girl from ACC or ACU, uh, from the Hill, they called it, to come and babysit. And I said, they need to go to bed at 7 o'clock, 7.30 at the latest. And... Uh, I came home at, Bill and I came home at 10.30 and Mark and the girl were still playing dominoes. 
And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm so sorry. I gave my word that he could stay up as long as he was winning. But when he lost, he could go to bed. And I'm telling you, the kid could play. And to this day, Carol Wilson and I have gone to a domino tournament, and I said, I'd rather have Mark as a partner. <laughs> yeah, I can play dominoes. Um, <clears throat> but I couldn't draw. Catherine got both That's of right. the art genes, um, and she got my share. Um, okay, so we moved to Memphis, and that was kind of cool because... Elvis Presley had Graceland, and I can remember every Christmas we'd drive through. He decorated it incredibly, and uh, we'd drive through and see all the lights and stuff. But that's the first time, to my knowledge, that you took a job outside the house. You managed the Walden's Bookstore at the mall in Memphis. And I started school there, so this would have been, I, I was kindergarten age, first grade, and part of second grade before we move. So that's how I age it for me. But uh, uh, what, what were some of the things that happened in there? Because you've got some great stories. Well, uh, I found out when we lived in New Orleans that people really love to come to see us. And I really liked for them to. I like to cook. And it was such fun because I didn't live in a town with we, uh, relatives. I only had new friends, no old friends. So they would come to see us in New Orleans. And so when we moved, in, not too many people came when we lived in Shreveport. We did do fishing, but that was about it. But when we got to Memphis, I don't know if you guys have seen the Memphis Memorial uh, Cemetery, but it's my favorite place to take people. Yeah, people are dying to get in. <laughs> and, well, they have... Uh, an artist that I would take Catherine to all the places where they had great artists and so forth, because I secretly hoped she would be exactly what she is today. And um, there is a guy there who made um, trees and benches and tea houses. Uh, he was from Mexico. And he only has, he has something in San Antonio Hall and then he has something here in your zoo uh, in the aviary. the aviary. But you really, if you go to Memphis, don't forget to go by and see the grotto because they brought in 2,500 crystals and it's a man-made cave. So we take everybody to the cemetery and then, or the, the uh, bookstore. And there was a children's section I had in the back of the bookstore, and I, the kids would sit. And that, they try and we'd read all the books without buying them. I'd say, you know, you have wash your hands. And, and so there's a smorgasbord of, you've been to children's bookstore, so they're happy reading. And that's when I met the mistress for Caleb Gabron. I met the people that had been abducted by the aliens. I met people that lived in the center of the earth. I met an irregular was, um, uh, what was Elvis's cousin's name? Um, I got Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis. His wife, who was 13 or 14. And um, they'd had a child drowned in their baby pool, in their swimming pool, which was shaped like a piano. And... Um, so she said, what can I do? What can I do? And I said, you can only think about one thing at a time. And so you, you can think about God or you can read. And so she said, recommend a book. And I recommended Nancy Drew because she was 14. And she read the entire series. Hmm. Did you know that? No, I did not. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I, so one of my memories is because mom worked, we had a kind of a nanny slash housekeeper, and her name was Mary. Mary. And uh, uh, this was back, I just remember when I got out of school, we lived about two blocks, two and a half blocks from the school where I was in school. And, and we Catherine. Were, yeah, Catherine too. Um, and school would let out at like 2.30 or something like that, and we had to get home within 15, 20 minutes 
because if we weren't home within 15 or 20 minutes, dark shadows came on TV and Mary would lock the doors so the vampires couldn't get in while she watched dark shadows. And so we, we were either going to be locked out of the house or we had to be in the house by the time dark shadows started. So she could lock the door and scream for the next 30 minutes at Barnabas Collins coming to get whomever it was he was coming to get. And I didn't find out until later in life what was really going on there. And, uh, Mom, I think it's worth telling. Uh, Mary is the one who took care of Mark and Catherine. And Mary was black. We moved from Memphis two weeks before uh, Martin Luther King was killed. And so that tells you the... The vibe. The vibe. And next door to us lived, uh, they were building a house. And I came home from work one day, and Mary was very upset. And I said, what is the matter, Mary? What happened? And she said, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Because the construction workers next door tried to get Catherine to come over to the house. And they said, uh, and, and Catherine was going. Catherine was standing at the door, and Mary went after her. And Mary said, I had to use, I held my knife, which was a pocket knife, and I said, you come home, girl. And so she, she came home. Well, we didn't tell the kids, uh, we, because it, but that's why Mary had them get home immediately after school so and locked the door until either Bill or I came home. Uh, and I think that, that she had such courage to do that uh, in the times when, uh, so I'm going to tell you, that was really an education for me to choose good people to look after your children. Yeah, it's really amazing. This. I mean, you've got, you've got white construction workers who are trying to take advantage of a second-grade girl. And uh, uh, I had no knowledge. They, they kept the knowledge from us. But for Mary to have the courage to take a knife and go to those construction workers, white construction workers. And, and, and they were burly guys. And say, you, you mess with these children and I'm going to knife you. Um, that's, 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 uh, uh, that's, that's courage. Put, she put her own life on the line for us. And I, I don't know where... Mary is today, if Mary is still alive today, but, but my heart is one of gratitude for her. Yep. Um, all right, we moved to Pittsburgh. We can pass over that. No, no, no. Yes, That's when I got my baby. That's Holly. Uh, just barely. And she never forgave me because did you ever fill out any form? And Pittsburgh is a big word. Pennsylvania is a big word. She wasn't, we lived in Coriopolis, which is a big word. And she lived in, we were, she was born in Swickley, or vice versa, another big word. And she, she trying, you, she can write little, I'm telling you. Okay. Okay, well, my big memory of Holly being born is, um, <laughs> this was before people knew if it was going to be a boy or a girl. I mean, now they know like five weeks before conception, I think, but... Back then, we didn't know, so I desperately wanted a baby brother. Meanwhile, Catherine desperately wanted a baby sister. And so we are arguing back and forth as if one of us is going to be able to persuade mom on which one to have. We don't understand the biology of it. We think that mom gets to pick when she's in the hospital. And so we're there, we're arguing back and forth. Well, because Catherine was older, she had a later bedtime than me. And so I go to sleep one night, and I wake up the next morning. My grandparents are there with me, and they say, your mom is in the hospital having a baby, having, your, having the baby. And I'm thinking, well, I went to sleep 30 minutes before Catherine because she was older. She had a later bedtime. I'm sure, knowing my sister and her Machiavellian ways, that she has lobbied mom in my absence and talked mom into having a girl instead of a boy. And so uh, we get word that Holly has been born and Holly's a girl and I am absolutely livid. I am so upset and I decided I'm never going to talk to this kid. I am not going to talk to her. 
So mom and, and Holly come home. My grandparents, uh, mom's maiden name was Holly, H-O-L-L-E-Y, and they wanted Holly to take that maiden name but wanted it to be spelled differently, so they spelled it H-O-L-L-I-E, Holly, Holly I Beth. E. And uh, so Holly comes home, and mom's got her in the crib asleep. And, I, and, and I'm not allowed in there. You know, it's everybody be quiet. The baby's asleep. Um, I sneak in, and I look at her in the crib, and I see this beautiful little baby sleeping. And I just remember thinking, eh, this isn't that bad. I think I'll talk to her after all. And uh, I have just, what a change she's made in the world and certainly in our lives. Uh, and uh, it's just been so much fun. But uh, Catherine, good job getting a girl there at the end. Um, all right, we moved to Rochester, New York. And that was bizarre because we had been brought up in a very strict church tradition. It uh, goes by Church of Christ. And part of the strictness of the Church of Christ is an understanding of back then. It's not this way so much now, but back then, uh, it's an understanding that, quote, we got it figured out, close quote, and most other people don't. And so we didn't want to, mom and dad didn't want their kids going to, back then in Rochester, almost everything was a Catholic church, and they were not going to take us to the Catholic church. Let me interrupt. I, I, well, I was going to ask you a question. Tell the story. <laughs> okay. Here, um, I'm interrupting because I grew up with my dad working for the Humble Oil Company, and they changed names. But we lived in New Orleans, and I went to a Catholic church and a Catholic school. And my parents were horrified because when my, I came home, we prayed, and I prayed uh, the Catholic prayer. And so I was determined that not to make that mistake with our kids. And we couldn't find a church where they didn't call the pastor father. So we started a church in our home. And I was going to tell this later, but uh, Catherine invited Anna. And Anna was, um, is still Catherine's friend uh, and mine. I got a note from her this week and she sent a picture of her baby but we julie came to live with us yeah I, i'm gonna interrupt for a moment because right. we have we tell we do this a lot yeah we we have so many dear friends and and i've got so many people who love the lord and walk with the lord who are in the catholic church and so we're yes. not denigrating that no. at all this is just what our life was like back then and our perspective back then and so uh, God's grown us to, to understand things differently. But, but within the process of all of that, uh, I'm really impressed to this day, not only with the fact that y'all had us in a home church and we had church every Sunday in our home, but the story of Julie now Cook, uh, who still watches this class, by the way, on the internet. God bless you, Julie, if you're watching. Um, uh, is a really cool story. Tell the tell the ju t t jury. Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury. I am still in trial. Uh, it's a truth. I'll be in Cleveland in the morning, cross-examining a pharmacist. Uh, uh, please tell our friends and, and here and family here about Julie Cook. Well, what was uh, so nice about living the, in the apartments next to RIT. Which is Rochester Institute of Technology. We lived in an apartment complex across the street from one of the colleges yes. in Rochester, New York. And so uh, people would either sit at the playground or sit on their steps, and you'd meet people from all over the world. And I met the people uh, who told me, and I met Julie uh, daily. They had asked her had gotten permission to bring her from the Oklahoma orphanage to take care of their children. And their children had reached the age that they no longer needed a babysitter. And Julie was in her last, starting her last year of school, call it, uh, high school. And um, they were going to send her back to the orphanage. And Julie didn't want to go. And so um, I said, do you mind if she lives with us? 
to finish the year. And they said, no, as long as they still got the money that came from the state for taking care of her. And Julie had no clothes that were cute at all. And we had such fun because I had a sewing machine and they had a machine, they had a shop there where you could go and buy leftover material for 10 cents a pound. It didn't matter what you got. And so we made some of the cutest things you ever saw. And it's not surprising at all that the boy that she was crazy about, named Peter, uh, who used to do the band in our basement. And yeah, yeah, yeah. They played uh, Closer to Home by Grand Punk Railroad. Pretty good rendition. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So we had Julie, but we also had next door to us um, the Parks, and they were from Korea, and they did not speak English. And they asked me, their, some relative came through town and said, they're here, would you teach them to drive? And I thought they'd had a car before, but they didn't. <laughs> and so after, I carried Holly with me in the car while the kids were at school. The first time we drove, you didn't have car seats. And his eyes locked on the, some kind of water main, and we hit it. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, it's well, okay, so let's, let's be fair to the Farks. Asking you to teach someone to drive <laughs> is functionally akin to asking someone with laryngitis to sing the national anthem. What can I say? So <laughs> I, I asked Bobby Brown, who lived down the street from us, and her, her husband was with Wilmer Alexander and the Dukes. And they, really good college band, go ahead. And they were really good, I asked her to watch. But I asked Holly, while I taught her the parks to drive, but I also said, please don't take her in the basement, because marijuana was, I don't know if it was legal in New York, it probably wasn't. No, it but, wasn't. Okay. <laughs> And I know what happened in that basement. So we never went to the basement, and Holly didn't go either. But um, we, we loved the parks. We met Val and Marion Capone, who were marvelous. It, it, it's V-A-L, not A-L, Capone. And their son, Jimmy, uh, we talked Texas all the time. Um, I w and he came to the University of Texas. Yeah, wound up, uh, took a football scholarship at the University of Texas and played uh, offensive guard. Because of but also, football. while we lived in New York, when we first moved up there, it was so bitter cold. And I said to Bill, we need to do family things, and I have a baby that you took two hours to get into a snowsuit. We needed to figure something to do at home. And as soon as you get her in, guess where she had to go? Um, <laughs> But we learned bridge, and the kids were, I don't know how old you were, third, fourth grade? Yeah, it didn't matter. We were still winning. Um, <laughs> it, I just grew They up wanted 42. to be my partner. Yeah. <laughs> um, we moved to Lubbock. Yes. Now, one of the things that amazed me with, with you, especially as I had kids of my own, is the way you were able to tailor different things things to, to the kids differently. So um, uh, for me, it was give me a chess set and let me go play chess. For Catherine, it was give her a sketchbook and let her draw and, and all. But Holly, you would take the silverware drawer and dump it out on the kitchen table and she would just love with glee getting to put all the forks and knives and spoons back where they go in order, stacked up very neatly. She was an accountant at heart. Took a degree in accounting. That's exactly right. Um, right. How did you know how to do things differently with each of us? Well, I do think as a twig is bent, so grows the tree. And so uh, I, I tried to tr teach you first, trust the Lord. And then second, look for your passion. Look for th the things you love to do. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to tell. Oh, I might tell this about Holly. Um, after all the kids were in school, I decided to go back to work. I had sued, I was president of the League of Women Voters, and we had sued the city 
for single mis member districts because everybody was elected at large and that meant the same people got elected every year and we wanted it divided by where people lived. Yeah, I, look, she's being polite. What happened was originally Lubbock had it set up where everybody voted for just the city council, period. And so it meant the minority areas. And, and Lubbock has th had three distinct communities when I was growing up there. They had the white community, the Hispanic community, and the African-American community. And the only people that got elected to the city council were the white people because they had the majority vote and they could go vote. And, and so you had an all-white city council that, that really looked to the all-white interest of the all-white electorate. And uh, mom, uh, I'm very proud of, uh, uh, she and, uh, was president of the League of Women Voters at the time and sued the city uh, uh, in federal court to set up single member districts so that-, that We you, won. Yeah, so that- <laughs> So there would be fair representation of the city in the city council and not just uh, of the good old boy network. Um, and the, uh, the, we had a good city manager. Uh, it was not his fault. Larry Cunningham was his name. But uh, he said, and the person they had that was human relation director was also a white man. So I said, this is ridiculous. And he said, and you think you can do any better? I'll hire you. And I said, okay, I can do a lot better. <laughs> and so that's when I went to work. Well, the first, one of the first things we started to do was um, work with the police. We had some good police but they did not know the minority neighborhood. So I had a big meeting in the council chamber uh, where the police came to meet uh, the community, black and brown, and I left Holly downstairs in my office. And that was kind of an open office and the door was opened and so people could come and go. And a guy came in there into the bottom office and he was ready to go with all the electric typewriters and he started carrying them out. And Holly came upstairs and she said, Mom, there's a guy up there carrying out all the, down there carrying out all the typewriters. So the police were right there. So I, <laughs> they got him. Well, Holly, fifth grade, had to testify in court. That is scary for an adult. And so if you don't teach your kids anything else, I think you need to teach them, don't let fear stop you from doing the right thing. So my little, my little five-year-old girl. Fifth grade. Went, <laughs> went, a fifth, five, fifth grade girl went to trial and said, yes, he's the man. Yes, he did it. But we did go home, and she said, I'd like to get glasses and change my hair. <laughs> uh, Mom, uh, you wound up, uh, you know, when, when I remember one Thanksgiving. Y'all remember Peter Jennings? He used to be on the new NBC or one of those big three, ABC. Uh, he would have his person of the week. Uh, each week, we did a series on that. And, and we went home for Thanksgiving one year, me and Becky and the kids, and went to Lubbock for Thanksgiving. And uh, uh, dad was insistent we all sit down and watch Peter Jennings uh, news that night. And because uh, it, it was going to be the person of the week. And we're like, oh, okay. So, you know, this means something to dad, we will. And so we sat down and we watched. And his person of the week was my mom. <laughs> Now, the reason why was twofold. Mom opened the first food bank in West Texas, certainly, but one of the first food banks anywhere uh, out in Lubbock. Uh, she raised the money for it and opened it and then opened up a dehydration plant that at, at, for a while at least was listed in the Guinness Book of World Record and uh, did it all without government funding, basically just going to the community and, and raising the money and, and getting it put together. Great community. Lubbock is fabulous. Well, they know that. It's the hub of the plains. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, uh, mom did all of that to the glory of God. Uh, it was always to the glory of God, but there is a story 
that I want you to tell, because God gets the glory for this. It's the sweet potato story when you were running the food bank. Would you well, tell do, that story? Do we have time? Uh, we've got four and a half minutes. Okay. One of the things that happened is um, when we first opened the food bank, the Salvation Army would give people a voucher that needed food for $15. And they would go to the store and the easy thing, that's an easy thing to do. We had opened the food bank and we were supplying Women's Protective Shelter and all the other places, but the Salvation Army was not giving uh, us coupons. So we said, we don't charge for the food, but I have to pay insurance and gasoline and so forth. So for $10, if you will give us $10, we will give you enough food to feed a family of four for a week. A dry box, a frozen box, and a fresh box. Fresh box. Thank you. Okay. There was also a Frito-Lay plant there. And they'd fire one potato, and if they didn't like the color of the chip, they'd throw all the potatoes away. So I said... Give those potatoes to the food bank. The phone rang one afternoon, and the woman who spoke said, this is Alpha Campbell, and I'm calling because I'm 87 years old, and I'm getting, I got a voucher from the Salvation Army, and I want a sweet potato in my basket. And I said, this is Campbell. We don't have any sweet potatoes. But she said, darling, I'm praying for a sweet potato. <laughs> My daddy told me to eat a sweet potato every fall, and I have not had one today or all year. And I said, but we have 40,000 40, pounds of white potatoes that Frito-Lay has just given us. I can give you enough white potatoes to last you all winter. She said, I'm trusting God for that sweet potato. <laughs> and I didn't want God to look bad. <laughs> and we don't normally buy food. But I got up and I started to go out and I said, Gilbert, who was the driver for me. He'd been a, a driver when he was a little kid as a migrant going through the fields while his fam family threw things in. He was a great driver. I said, get my car out. I need to go buy a sweet potato so God doesn't look bad. And he said, well, just a minute. There's a truck backing up. And so the truck backed up and I, he said, stop, stop. Don't, Miss Carolyn needs to get her car out. And the guy got out of the truck and he had on a, a no shirt, but a leather vest and had tattoos and feather earrings and. Good looking dude. Yeah. I mean, you know, just normally, not the person you would think would be an angel. And he said, uh, I don't have time for you. And then he cursed, and I thought to myself, anybody can curse, but a smart person doesn't have to. So I thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm on my mission. I said, okay, what have you got? And he threw the back gate up of the truck, and he said, I have 42,000 pounds of sweet potatoes, yams. <laughs> And so I ran back into my office. I called Mrs. Campbell back and I said, stop praying. <laughs> we have 42,000 pounds of sweet potatoes. I had asked the man why we got them. And he told me they're little, they're runts. They're too small to sell. So when I told Mrs. Campbell, stop praying, that I had 42,000 pounds, she said, I hope they're little ones. I hate them big ones. <laughs> so you think about it. God knows what kind of sweet potatoes you like. He knows how many hairs on your head. 
and you can trust God to get us through. Amen. We did Thank it. Thank you, Bob. So, good uh, would you join me in a prayer of blessing? And thank you guys for being here this morning. It's yes. time for church. Lord, I thank you so much for our mom. Uh, I thank you for the testimony she has always been to you, the way she has pointed our lives to you, uh, instilled your faith in us, the love for your word, a love for, for good, fair, right thinking and uh, all things that, that are right and pure and lovely and of good repute. And so I ask your blessings on her. I thank you for her willingness to share this morning. I thank you for our friends and family that are here and pray that in the name of Jesus, you will bless them all with whatever small sweet potato needs they've got right now in their lives as the abundant, loving God you are. In Jesus' name, amen.